Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our podcast. This is I Compete, Building Your Empire with John Hewitt, live from the castle. Hi, I'm Roberta Barrett. I'm John Hewitt's producer. You might be asking, who is John Hewitt? Well, he is the Hewitt in Jackson Hewitt Tax Services. If you want to find out more about John Hewitt and what he's currently doing, go to loyaltybrands.com. That's loyaltybrands.com. Or find John T. Hewitt on LinkedIn or Facebook. John Hewitt's made over a thousand millionaires and you could be the next one. Here is your host, John Hewitt. Thank you, Roberta. And uh, well, I want to welcome Bob Gappa, who's one of the most incredibly experienced people ever. Uh, he's almost ha- he's almost as old as I am. He's been in franchising his his almost his entire career. And uh, tell us about yourself, Bob. Well, uh, I've been very fortunate to have great mentors. And uh, when I formed Management 2000, uh, 41 years ago. Uh, what I wanted to do was help people who either were franchising or who wanted to franchise to do it better, quicker, and faster. And so we developed a consultancy to those entities and I think really contributed. And I've been blessed to uh, be able to work with over 1,650 brands in 41 years and uh, believe in... uh, Missions, visions, values, and processes get you better results. Thanks, John. That's awesome. And I don't know of anyone else that even even uh, consulted with over 300 brands, let alone 1,650. That's just, wow, amazing. I want to talk about... And, working, uh, and working with you, too, and two of your other brands. So that's been a real blessing for me. Right. So it's, it's my two and the other 1,648, right? <laughs> So I want to talk about uh, business authors, and uh, I had an epiphany related to one that I think uh, an author that is one of your favorites, too, Peter Drucker. What do you know about Peter Drucker? Well, I uh, I know that uh, he couldn't get a business degree, and so he uh, he got a degree in another field and uh, came to America. And uh, his first one of his first jobs was with Sloan and Kettering at General Motors, reorganizing General Motors uh, basically against Ford. And uh, he helped them understand that the customer was more important than the car. And getting people and getting an understanding of who the customer was and what they valued and how General Motors could uh, enhance what the customer valued helped them sell more cars. And so he focused General Motors around the customer, not the car. And I know that his books on uh, uh, have been a, of great help for me and a lot of other people around the world. And he's often called the father of management. That's what I know. Do you, um, you know what year that was approximately, what decade that he was working at General Motors? I don't for sure, John, but I'm thinking 50s. Uh, but what I also know is that there were very, very few business schools at that time where you could where you could go and focus in undergraduate or graduate school. And so uh, management and leadership really exploded in this country uh, because rather than just using the military model after the wars, because leadership was a lot about that. Uh, Drucker focused on the customer, and it made a different business model for leadership and management. Uh, so that's too long of an answer to your short question. Uh, no, there, there can't be ever be too much information about giving, um, um, exceeding customers' expectations. And and yeah. my one of my favorite stories on focusing on the customer versus versus not caring and not doing a great job is, I think the story goes. And, and you can embellish it for me that in in the teens in the nineteen seventeen eighteen nineteen Ford uh, there was there was Ford Motor Company and and of course Henry Ford invented the assembly line and and he was crushing everyone and and my recollection of the story is there was Ford who had about a fifty percent market share and and everyone there was a bunch of smaller ones with one or two percent market share and there was twenty thirty forty different different organizations and Henry Block um, in one of the most 
obnoxious, um, backward thinking of a customer came up with it. To me, I think it's a dumb, virtually the dumbest thing that's ever been said. He said, they can have any color that they want as long as it's black. And, mm-hmm. right. and General Motors got a group of, of, they got together the Pontiac and the Buick and the, whatever, all the, all the different brands. And they said, we're going to work. Not only are we going to give that the customer, we're going to listen to the customer because we asked the customer, what do you want? And they said, we want, the, we want different colors. And Ford said, yeah. Ford said, again, you can have, they can have any color they want just as long as they get black. And so he was just deaf ear to the customer. And then they started giving them uh, like seats, padded seats instead of the, the hard seats. And it was, it, it wasn't even 10 years, maybe five years that General Motors became bigger than Ford. And it was just simply by listening to customers. And that's happened so often in, in there's so many great stories in history about that, that for example, in, I believe it was in the thirties that Coke uh, had a, a market share of about 70% or 80% and, and Pepsi had 15 and, and RC Cola, I think had five. And so there was three big brands and, and Pepsi came up, hit with a, an incredible, a, a credible marketing philosophy. And they said, and, and should I, should I quiz you and, and, uh, and ask you why Pepsi almost caught Coke or should I give you the answer? Give me the answer. Okay. So what, what Pepsi did is simplistically, and this was about the time of world war, World War II, and and uh, a bottle of Coke was a nickel. And so what Pepsi did is they they doubled the size, and they said twice as much for a nickel. And so for for a, a few years, Coke said that's not going to work. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. And and meantime, Pepsi was catching them, and Coke was falling, and and Coke went down to about a 50% market share from about 80 and Pepsi went up to about a 45% market share and almost caught them until you know what Coke did. They copied Pepsi because they listened to the customer. And yeah. that's just, I mean, there's so many examples and, and I learned a long time ago in business, you don't make money from trying to change customers mind. You make money from, from giving, giving them what they want. And, and the last story I'll tell on that one is uh, the Avis story. Uh, Hertz in the, in the 50s, um, almost no one is as old as I am can remember the 50s, but in the 50s, they didn't have rental cars. There was no Hertz or Avis or, or National or any, there was, no, there was no rental cars. What you would do is, and there was not a lot of travel either, so there wasn't a big demand. And uh, Hertz flew into uh, Los Angeles and he, the only place you could rent a car was at a car dealer. So he took a taxi from, from the airport into the car dealer. And he said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's 20 minute drive. I mean, there should be a rental place right next to the airport. And so they, he became a, they became a national company, fortune 500 company. And a few years later, Walter Avis walked into it through an airport and said, why should I have to go outside, take a bus and go two miles to the rent a car? Look at that space over there, that corner. There's, I could put a little desk over in that corner, a kiosk, and I could, they could rent cars right here. And for three years, Hertz said, and this is this, it's in the Walter Avis story. There's a book about it. Um, but for three years, Hertz said, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. And finally, just in time, they started going into the airline, into the airports, just like Avis was. And so they were able to maintain their market share, but each of them, each of those companies, great companies, I mean, just great companies didn't, didn't pay attention to customers. The, uh, and I, I think it's almost a CEO disease that, that when they they take over a company, they think they're supposed to know everything, and what they're what they're supposed to do is, in my opinion, is take the pulse of the customers and uh, give the customers what they want to exceed the customers' expectations. So interesting. There was no question, that, but but were you going to comment? Well, what I was what I was 
speaking about because I, you know, you, you're on track very definitely or with what you're talking about with CEOs. The thing I've noticed is that at the, at the luxury end of any product or service is where the companies have to pay more attention to the voice of the customer, whether it's renting jets or yachts or resorts or hotels or cars. Whenever you get to the most expensive end of a product or service, people pay the most attention to the voice of the customer because they have such a smaller group of people they have to win over. And people in the middle don't listen to that advice, that reality. Yep. And the, let me talk, let me talk to you about an epiphany I had um, that's related to this and, and this management style in, in the Peter Drucker, the effective executive you want to tell us the story about Lincoln and Grant? What happened with uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Lincoln and Congress? You know that Are story? Are we talking? Well, let me let me see if I do. And correct me real quickly. Break in if I'm not if I'm not thinking what you're thinking about. Uh, Grant was winning a lot of wars, but he had a drinking problem, and the generals were trying to get rid of Grant because he was such a threat to them. And they tried to talk Lincoln out of uh, uh, preferring Grant. And I believe there was something in there who said, you know, I know you guys think he's got a drinking problem. Maybe you guys should start drinking because he never loses battle. Was it something like that? Yeah, but I'm going to, ex- yes, it was exactly like that, but I'm going to expand that story a little. Oh, good. good. Okay. Because um, one of the things he says in the book and, you have if you have to start with this premise and believe it for the story to make sense, and that is, he says in the effective executive, and it's all about this this premise that the people with great strengths have great weaknesses. the 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 more great your strengths are, the more your more weaknesses you have. The less strengths, the less weaknesses. And he said, but you can't hire people that or not having weaknesses because then you get people that are mediocre that won't take chances that won't won't perform and won't do anything so you need what you need to be able to do is to hire someone that has great strengths but you can put up with their weaknesses and and sometimes as in this case with grant it's it's a fine line whether you can put up with it and so it yeah it started out that i think the first general that lincoln hired was uh, McClellan and he sat with three times the soldiers, five times the amount of horses, 10 times as much money, uh, five times as much guns and ammunition. He sat there and sat there because he didn't want to make a mistake for a year. In the meantime, Robert E. Lee is running around the countryside, winning little battles and skirmishes and grabbing, grabbing union uh, land. And uh, so Lincoln fires him. And then he hired another general, and I guess Lincoln hadn't learned his lesson by that point because the, the second general, uh, he sat there for three months, but Lincoln was less patient. He got rid of him. And then he hired uh, Ulysses S. Grant, and Grant attacked, and he won. And then he attacked, and he lost. And and then he won two, and he lost one, and won three, and lost one, and we're winning the war. And now something was happening, and... Uh, the end was in sight. We were winning the war, but but as you said, um, he was an, apparently a drunk, and um, so Congress finally came. They, they sent a a group, a bipartisan group of congressmen, came to the White House to ask Lincoln, say, "You got to fire him. He's he's an embarrassment. He's not a gentleman. He has his dog at." He swears he he fires his gun up in the up in the air, and he he's a total drunk. And Lincoln said to his he said to his secretary he said James, find out what brand of alcohol Grant drinks, and buy a barrel for each of my generals. And they they went out of there with their tails between their legs, right? 
And of course, yeah. not only did Grant win the war, but he became the president of the United States. So I guess he must not have been that much of a drunk. Uh, but yeah. um, the and and if Grant hadn't had gone too far, let's say in one of his drunken rampages, he shot someone, right, or that then and killed some one of his own people, then he would have had been to get rid of. But Lincoln was a, was able to put up with his weaknesses because of his great strengths. And what what I've so I've been preaching that for decades, and I finally realized that. That in my companies, um, uh, the, my epiphany that I just had over the last week was this, that you, almost everyone comes to me complaining about someone else. Virtually all my, all my employees come in, especially my executives, and they complain about the other one, right? And so yeah. I, I've come to realize that 98% of people are, are not Lincoln. 98% yeah. of people don't get it. They don't understand. They, it's so easy, Bob, to, to cut someone down and talk about their weaknesses. Have you ever found someone you couldn't? I mean, you're a consultant, so that's what you get paid to do is find people's weaknesses, right? Is it, I mean, isn't it always easy to find people's weaknesses? Uh, absolutely. And I'll share this story with, with you. When I, went, when I left working for the Catholic bishops, and the bishop I worked for wanted to help me transfer into secular life with the skill sets he perceived I had. He introduced me to, to Joe Batten. I've mentioned he wrote Tough Minded Management and some other books uh, that, that were are really good and positive. And when you joined his company, Joe Batten's company, in the first 30 days, you had to list 100 of your strengths. Because he said, we're consultants and we have to help companies spot the strengths of people so they can be deployed for results. And so working for him was the first time in my life where someone said, we don't do a SWOT analysis. We do, where are the gaps in the strengths we need to achieve our results? And let's find people who have the strengths to fill those gaps. He would not tolerate talking about people's weaknesses. And I just, I don't do it either. It's too easy. You said a word, that acronym, that some of the listeners aren't going to know. SWAT. SWAT, yeah. What is that? Strengths, weaknesses, internal strengths and weaknesses, external threats and opportunities. And what I look at is strengths and gaps threats and opportunities. No, it's, um, it's interesting that when you say that and the lesson you learn, because on our, on our call, our internal call with uh, the CEOs of, of a, a dozen of our brands, you said mm -hmm. that you asked them each for their goals and mm -hmm. you, you asked them, okay, now if you're going to achieve that goal, what are the key things that you, we need to achieve or the key, the key resources you need to achieve those goals? Uh, you didn't ask them what the the threats are or, or the, the threats there, but you focused on on the key uh, the, the key ingredients for their success. And is, yeah. is and why'd you do that? Why didn't you say okay? I mean, I mean, were you deliberately thinking that that I'm not going to ask them okay what stands in the way of that? I'm going to ask them what they need, what tools, resources. They need to achieve their goals. My experience is that most of the clients I've had in my life look for what their constraints and roadblocks are rather than what they can do and focus on doing that better. Oftentimes that takes care of and eliminates the constraints and bottlenecks. Sometimes not, but people are, are not... As you said, they're just not as aware of their strengths as it is their perceived weaknesses. Uh, but anyway, that's, yeah. So, it's a waste of time. you, you got to be aware of what your gaps are, what, what you need to succeed. And if you call those weaknesses, then you're, you're going to be inhibited by that awareness. You just look at it. You're looking at it the wrong way. Kind of like the glass half full, half empty. In a way, you've you've had 
uh, you've consulted with 1,650 countries or companies, more than 1,650. What percentage of, of them would you say were great companies? Less than five. And? Percent. Less than 5%. And the the 5%, the, the greatest com- companies, what, uh, do, do they focus on strengths and they focus on results? Or were they um, micromanagers, activity-driven and trying to trying to um, cut out their weaknesses. They focused on first of all the customer and how you got how you maximize the markets the franchisees were in, how you dominated the markets you were in, and they focused on a true accountability for results, so that I don't have to be concerned unless you're brand new in, in, in the company. I don't have to be concerned with whether or not you're getting results and doing the right things. Uh, it's like I say about, about you and, and your companies. You create the future and you depend on other people to make it happen. It's not that you don't check on the numbers to make sure that's going on, but your focus is on creating the future in your brands, not managing the present. And... What, what percentage of the companies were just um, didn't understand this simple concept? Because this, to me, is the simplest concept of success in, in, as a franchisor. And I have to say that over the last 10 years, half the companies that have started in franchising that thought they could be a franchisor have failed. And yeah. what, so of the 1650, how many do you think understood this simple concept? Happy, successful franchisees. The key to success is happy, successful franchisees and happy, successful employees. John, it's got to be, again, less than 5%. It's a, it's a differentiator, and it's not a hard concept. Yeah. You know, when I, left my no. la- when I left my last franchisor on the wall, we had it in big letters, like four-foot letters, happy, successful franchisees. And with, yeah. within two months of me leaving, they whitewashed the wall. So you walked yeah. into the building, and it used to say happy, successful franchisees, and now you're looking at a white wall. And, and they, didn't, they showed it by the way they acted, but that was a little bit over the top when they, they took it off the wall because they didn't want any franchisees. I, I assume, I, know, I try not to get into the cesspool of how they think, but... Um, I assume that they thought, well, if that's on the wall and I don't act that way, then they're going to come back to me and, and point at that. You're not making me successful. And so I assume that's why they, they, they whitewash it. But success isn't, isn't ext- extraordinarily difficult to understand. The basics of success are, are pretty simple. And, you know, people in, in my career have mostly said, uh, um, the when they've asked me what's what's the who's the biggest competitor or the biggest problem and i said we ourselves are the biggest problem because we have to we have to follow the principles we have to we have to exceed customers expectations i'm not worried about about my competitors i'm not worried about h&r block or or jackson hewitt or liberty or anyone else if if we do our job we're going to win and one in uh, one of my uh, former franchisees uh, was uh, um, he tried to spank me on on social media and he said and he said something about uh, me competing with him and I said Ed if you do your job if you if you exceed customers' expectations I can't hurt you you will succeed it's not Ed it isn't my competition isn't going to hurt you you can only hurt yourself yeah uh, it. Uh... If I didn't know who you were talking about that whitewashed the wall, I would say that their demise is close by because they've taken their eye off. The reason for being in business is economic performance, and you can't get that without somebody buying what you have for sale. And the only way for people to buy want is... You either have an exclusive or you do a better job at making them want what you have. And to me, that's the difference between a brand and a company. A brand is something that people want whether they can get it or not. 
uh, and people wanted an iPhone before whether they could get it or not. They loved it before they owned it. That's a brand. A phone I can get anywhere, but a product that other people love and I want to love it too, like flying Emirates, business class or first class. People hear about that and they want to do it. Uh, you know, it seems that sometimes other airlines' mission statement is, we're not happy till you're not happy. Uh, and they seem to train people on that. But, you know, we're only happy when you're happy is what you're achieving with happy, satisfied franchisees. Because happy, satisfied franchisees are happy and satisfied because they have happy and satisfied customers, right? Exactly. And, and we have about two minutes left. And uh, last question, and I don't know if you can say it in two minutes. Maybe we need to go for a whole another 30 minutes. But how do you change uh, that mentality? How do people get to be like a Lincoln? And can they? Can they make that change? Can they forget people's weaknesses and overlook them and, and say, wow, that person's really good? I mean, guess how many times someone comes into my office and says, that person's really good. They just did a great job. Can they, can they overcome that? My answer to that is each person who gets there has an epiphany. And you can orchestrate some epiphanies and some you can't. But people have to be open to going from good to better and better to best. And when they get the epiphany about who are our customers, what do they value, how can we enhance what they value, and they get knocked off their whatever... They'll be different, but it's a personal epiphany that makes it happen. I think you've had it. Other people have had it. And until you have it, you can't do anything about it. I don't think you can teach it. You can orchestrate it, but they have to have their own epiphany. Agreed. And and to, to do that, usually you have to be committed to improvement. And I think that's one of the many ways that you and I are like that. We are of a lifetime commitment to uh, improve. And uh, your your team, yeah. their management, 2000. 30 years ago when we did set up our our organization with our principles and, and our mission yeah. statement. Our mission statement was improve each day. So, And that, winning customers for life, right? Yep. Thank you, Bob. It was great Thank talking you, to you. A pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Feel the same. Bye. Thank you for taking the time to learn about how to build your empire with John Hewitt. Find John on LinkedIn at John T. Hewitt or message John Hewitt on Facebook. This is I Compete, live from the castle, building your empire with John Hewitt. Don't miss new episodes every Monday by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, cpnshows.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, this was I Compete, building your empire with John Hewitt.